Well, this morning we begin a new teaching series entitled Dream Team. If you are a sports fan, there is no better time of year than now because there is a plethora of activities in the sports world these days. Uh, There are a lot of sports teams you can get behind. Maybe it's Barcelona. Ooh. Thought I'd get a little bit more in it. Maybe it's the NBA Finals and these two basketball teams going at it. Maybe it's the Stanley Cups Finals. Maybe it's our ladies, our women's Canadian soccer national team. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, there are, maybe it's a cricket team. Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? I, I believe, and I, and I really mean this sincerely, and, and, and those of you who know me personally will know I, I, I'm an avid sports fan. Uh, but, but the greatest team of them all is the church. The church of Christ, the body of Christ, has the potential to be the greatest, most effective team on the planet. It's a God idea, the body of Christ. God has a burden to reach the world. He is on a redemptive mission, and he has called us to activate and be part of that. And I believe that Heartland, a church connected, is a key team on the overall grand scheme of God's redeeming plan for the greater Toronto area. And I believe that not one of you in this place is here by accident. Rather, I believe that every single person, every child has been called to belong to Heartland for such a time as this. Colossians says that all things are created by him, for him. God created you for him. He created you for a divine reason and purpose. He has a plan for your life. Paul also says that there are great works already planned ahead of time for you and I to accomplish. This morning, I want to speak about a man. His name is Moses. You'll find a portion of his story, and the story that I'll be sharing is right out of Exodus chapter 3 and 4 this morning. But God steps into Moses' life and he calls him. The title of my message is, I'm not sure if I have what it takes. You ever ask yourself, God, do I have what it takes to live up to the calling that you've placed on my life? You see, I believe every single one of you is called by God. The calling of God is not just for pastors just for evangelists or prophets. The call of God is on all of our lives. And we all have a key role to play in the kingdom of God. You all have a role to play into the life of this congregation. And if we can all grab hold of that vision and we all begin to move in the same direction, there is nothing that can stop the church of Jesus Christ. So this morning, we look at Exodus 3 and 4. God calls Moses. Moses has an interesting life journey. He was born, and he was born in a very volatile time, so much so that his mother puts him in a basket and sends him down the river in hopes that somebody would would find him and raise him and And what do you know, Pharaoh's daughter grabs him and raises him, and he's grown up in the palace lifestyle. As the years go on, he kind of gets himself into some trouble. He sees his people, the Israelites, being driven to slavery and mistreated and abused by the Egyptians. And, And out of his anger and his emotions, he murders an Egyptian. And so Pharaoh catches word of that, and so Moses has to flee for his life. And 
he finds himself in a far away land and he just becomes a shepherd. The scriptures say, because Acts refers to Moses' life, that he was a shepherd for over 40 years. And so he's right now in the brink of kind of retirement mode. He's ready to hang it up. He's a shepherd. And as he's in a faraway land and he's shepherding the sheep, he sees in the distance this burning bush. And so out of curiosity, he walks over to the bush. And he noticed something unique about this. Not only is this bush on fire, but it's not burning up. And then as he gets closer, he hears a voice, the voice of the Father, the voice of God. And he says, Moses, Moses. He calls him by name. He doesn't say, sir. He doesn't say, shepherd. Moses, Moses. Assuredly, if God knows the amount of hairs on your head, he knows your name. And when he calls you, he calls you. He calls you by name. He doesn't just say, hey, you guys over there. He says, Jim, Sandy, Joel, Trevor. I know your name. In fact, I created you for a purpose. And so Moses responds, here am I, here, here, God, I'm right here. And he's walking towards this bush and God says, hold up. This is holy ground. And so he takes off his sandals and covers his face out of fear of God. You see, this isn't just an ordinary calling. It's a holy calling. When God calls you for a purpose, it's not just a voice amongst many other voices. It is the voice. And there should be this sense of reverence for God that when he calls us and he he, he shows us the purpose for our life, we don't just deal with it in a flipping and and, and unorganized and, and uncaring way. No, 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 no. This is a holy calling. It's time to take off the sandals. It's time to cover our face and say, God, here am I. It is but a joy to serve you. You're calling me by name, the God of the universe. Then the chapter goes on and says, all that was burdening God. He says to Moses, Moses, I'm burdened for the people of God. They're being harassed. They're being murdered. They're being treated like slaves. And I want to free them from their bondage. At this point, I'm sure Moses was saying, yes, God's going to come down and save us. Oh, man, I can't wait to see how he does it. I mean, Moses had that same kind of burden. I mean, that's what caused him, unfortunately, to murder that Egyptian because he was burdened for his people as well. So when he heard his God be burdened for his people, he thought, oh, he's on our side. I'm going to get a seat, and I'm going to watch him do it. But then something happens, doesn't it? After God shares his burden for the people, he says to Moses in verse 10, So now, go. Moses, so now, now that you've heard my burden, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Whoa, God, God, God. I I love your burden. I love the fact that you're going to rescue us and set us free, but that's your burden. You figure it out. What do I have to do with this? And he comes up with a litany of excuses as to why he's not his guy. As to why he doesn't see himself as part of this dream team. God, you you got the wrong person. In many ways, Moses says to God, who, me? 
And God says, yeah, you. Okay, I think this is cheesy, but we're going to do it anyways. I want you to look at the person and say, who me? And then the other person say, yeah, you. Go ahead. Okay, good. They say that good public speaking is you getting the crowd engaged. There you go. There's your engagement piece. I think it's cheesy, but there you go. Who, me? Yeah, you. Yeah, he was like, God, I, leading God's people out of slavery. I'm just a shepherd. I'm on the brink of retirement. So Moses responds to God's calling with a litany of excuses. And my hunch is that every single one of us, including myself, have used some of these excuses somewhere along the way. Maybe we're even presently using them as to why we are not qualified to be part of God's team. Excuse number one Moses gives God is this. God, I'm a nobody. God, I'm a nobody. Notice what he says in verse 11. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? I'm a nobody. Have you ever had that thought about your life? I don't have the, the experience. I don't have the talents and abilities like those other po folks over there. I haven't been around as long. I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm a nobody. God's response to excuse number one it was a simple one. In many ways, God says to Moses, I know. I know you're a nobody. That's why I'm coming with you. I know who you are. I know your background. I know everything about you. I know why you think you're not qualified. And, but the point is, that's why I'm coming with you. He says in verse 12, I'll be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. Ready? Here's the sign. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Interesting statement by the Lord. I will prove to you that I've been with you because one day when you have journeyed through the wilderness for many years, you will one day return back to this place and you will worship me there. And then you will know in your heart that I have been with you. Interesting, isn't it? You see, many times that is what our faith journey is all about. You see, Moses was going to have to go through all the ups, all the downs, all the doubts, all the insecurity, all the people's rebellion, all of his moments of doubt and moments where he doubted his calling. He was going to go through all of that, all the way to actually getting into the promised land, and then he would worship God in this place, and then it would all make sense. See, we know only afterwards that God has led us all the way. There's something about the life of faith that involves uncertainties in an essential way. And I think that sometimes because there are uncertainties as a church and as individuals, we refrain ourselves from doing anything that is a risk. But the point is, God is with us, and he will see us through to the other side. But we've got to start the journey, and he will prove himself faithful all the way through. You see, in many ways, we're forced to be reminded with the words of Christ when he said, apart from me, you can do so that means there's going to be moments in the life of this church, in the life of us fulfilling this vision of reaching lost people and discipling them and caring for them. There's going to be moments where there's going to be ups and downs and challenges and roadblocks and all sorts of stuff. 
But those are moments that help remind us I can't, we can't do this by ourselves. That's why. But if you never put yourself in a situation where you need God to show up, maybe that's why we've never seen God. And sometimes churches play it safe because they're scared. But friends, those are great opportunities to step out in faith because it's in those moments where we learn we can't do it without him. What we're dreaming is way bigger than ourselves. We need God to do something. The implication of God's response to Moses is that with God on our team, we can't be beat. With God on our team, we can't be beat. You see, this is the difference between sports teams and the kingdom of God. Sports teams like superstars. And superstars get highlighted and get trophies. In the kingdom, in the work of the Lord, there are no superstars. The point is we're out to make Jesus famous. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about any specific individual. The point is we all work towards making Jesus famous. May his name be lifted high in the greater Toronto area. Excuse number two. So Moses has this dialogue with God, but he has a different excuse. He says to God, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. We see it in verse 13. Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? What if I don't have the right answer? Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever thought to yourself, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to begin. I don't know where to start. You you get placed or given an opportunity to serve children in our children's ministry and and help mentor and grow up kids in their faith. And you're thinking to yourself, what about if they start asking me questions and I don't know the answer to? Maybe you engage in student ministries and you're working with teenagers with real life situations and they start asking you questions and you're like, boy, it's too complex for me. Small group leader, are you kidding me? And so we back off and we think to ourselves, there's no way I can do that because I don't know what to say. Similar to the excuse that Moses made. Friends, I want you to know that that was an excuse in my life for many years. And and I've shared a little bit over the, the, the last three and a half years, but I was... I prayed to God, God, if there's one thing I don't want to do is to preach or teach in front of people. I will do anything but that. Because I was horrified of being a public speaker. I was shy. My hands would sweat. They still do. Some of you know that. I shake hands, you're like, ooh. Because I realized, because I thought to myself, I won't know what to say. And every week before I stand here, in many ways, I sometimes still struggle. God, how do I say this? And yet every week, God proves himself faithful to me. And somehow he uses this mouth of this kid who was born in Laval, Quebec, who was raised in Vancouver, B.C., to help minister to his church and he was the shy kid who hid around, hid behind his mother all the time. I, I won't know what to say. But God says, in response to this excuse, I'll tell you what to say. Verse 14, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. There will be those moments in those complex situations. And it's more than just preaching. Sometimes I find myself 
in a counseling sessions and the, 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 the issues are, 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 are very complex and I'm going, God. And he helps us say what we need to say. He refrains us from saying things we shouldn't say. Because God is with us. He's with us. Moses, I'll tell you what to say. He doesn't stop there. He continues on to the next excuse. Excuse number three. Moses says, but what if they don't believe me? <laughs> okay, so, so God, I'll tell them that you sent me, but then what about if they, they don't receive it? What if they say, oh, get lost, Moses. You're a shepherd. You're, you're telling me you, what, talked to a bush? Moses, 1-800-PSYCHIATRIST. What if they don't believe me? What if they, in verse uh, 1 of chapter 4, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say the Lord did not appear to you? See, friends, this is the fear of failure. The fear of failure is always there, ready to grip and paralyze us. Let me tell you, I want to be honest. As your pastor, I wish I could say I'm always filled with boldness and courage. But I thank God for people around me, some great deacons that say, Pastor Joel, with God we can do this. Staff members that remind me of that. fact is, we're embarking on a grand vision to be part of God's purpose of reaching the GTA with the message of Christ. And this is a risk to build a, a facility in the mis middle of Mississauga. That is a huge risk. And there's part of me and maybe you that think, oh man, are we going to make this happen or not? They won't believe me. We won't, grant, we won't have all the favor. We won't have all the resources. The city won't. What if? God's response to Moses, I think, is telling. In many ways, God responds to his excuse by saying, Moses, that's not your job. He says to him in chapter 4, 2, and 9, he says, Moses, your job is to use what you have in your hand, and I'll take care of the rest. He says to Moses, Moses, what do you have in your hand? He says, oh, I have a staff. I'm a shepherd, remember? He says, take your staff, throw it on the floor, on the ground. And he does. And, the, and as it hits the ground, the staff turns into a snake. Moses then is told by the Lord, grab the snake by the tail. Of course, Moses, when he sees it turn into a snake, he runs for his life because he's scared. Calls him back, Moses, take it by the tail. He does so. As he touches it, it turns back into a staff. Then he says, Moses, take your hand. I want you to put it in your jacket. Puts it in his jacket. He takes it out. It's full of leprosy. He says, now, Moses, take that hand of leprosy. Put it back into where you got it, back into your jacket. And he does so. And take it out. He takes it out. It's completely healed. Then he says, take some water out of the Nile. Pour it out, and it'll turn into blood. What's God trying to tell Moses? He says, Moses... You do what you need to do, and I'll take care of the rest. You be obedient and use what you have in your hand. And you might think that what you have in your hand, it's small. It, it's meaningless. It's only a shepherd's staff, but you watch what I'll do. God is in the business of using small things and using them for his glory to do great things. You see, our job is to work. Our job is to labor. Our job is to use what we do have. And God will take care of the rest. Our job is to labor and work. It is God who brings in the harvest. Remember in Matthew 9, Jesus has been doing all sorts of ministry, needs all over the place. And finally, he's weary, he's tired. And he, and, and he looks at his disciples and he says, the harvest is ripe. But the laborers are few. The laborers are few. He says, don't pray 
for the harvest. The harvest is already ripe. The point is there's not enough laborers. There's not enough people who are willing to get on my team and get on mission to reach lost people and disciple them. So, David Platt, well-known author, says this, we live sacrificially, or sorry, the gospel that saves us from work also saves us to work. We're not saved by our works. There's nothing we can do to receive and prove ourselves enough to receive God's grace. We are saved by grace, point, period, simple. Not enough righteous act would be enough to receive his grace. So we, the gospel saves us from work, but it also saves us to work. You see, once we say yes to Jesus, everything changes. All of a sudden, it's not my life, it's his. In view of your mercy now, Lord, I offer my life to you as a living sac sacrifice may be holy and pleasing. My life is not my own any longer, and it is yours. I owe you for it. And so I will work and labor for your kingdom. I will grow tired, but I will do it for your glory. David Platt says, we live sacrificially, not because we feel guilty, but because we have been loved greatly and now find satisfaction in sacrificial love for others. We live radically, not because we have to, but because we want to. We live for God and use our gifts, talents, treasure, time, not because we have to. We don't do it begrudgingly. We don't serve our kids coming with a heart of, oh, I have to serve in there today. No, I get to serve. I get to invest in students. I get to sing and play music to the glory of God and help others experience the presence of God. I get to pastor an awesome church. I don't have to. And I don't do it begrudgingly, but I do it with my heart wide open because I do it on faith. Okay, so are we willing to work? Are we willing to labor for the kingdom? You know, I am convinced that if our church would like to take the next step in its influence in this region, if we want to continue to carry the burden of God for the so many lost families in our neighborhoods, it's going to take everybody doing their part. Not one person just being a spectator, but everybody engaged. We have some amazing volunteers. But friends, there are some of us who come and receive, and I'm so glad you do, and keep coming. But maybe now it's time for you to get in the game, get in the team, and contribute to the life of this church. In the fall, we've been praying, and we've also sent out a survey to you. You'll remember, and we got all your feedback, and we have been praying and feel led that in the fall, October the 3rd, we're going to launch a third worship gathering at Heart. It'll be Saturday nights at 6 p.m. Is it a risk? You betcha. Do I have moments of fear? Yeah. But we got to do more to reach more people. And so as a staff, we've been praying about it and we're counting the cost. It's going to change all of our family <laughs> and the rhythm of our homes. All of a sudden now, it's not just Sunday morning, it's I, we come on Saturday and preach and teach and lead and guide. And then Sunday morning, we do it two times over again. It's going to change us. But you know what? As a leadership team, our lives are not our own. We're ready to make that sacrifice to serve you and the community. But we're also going to need you. We're going to need several more children's volunteers. We're going to need several more first impression team members. We're going to need several more musicians. We're going to need several more intercessors. We're going to need several more of everything. And so we're going to you today, and I'm going to talk about this at the end. We're asking you to get on the team and use your life to the glory of God because he created you for himself. Your life has a purpose and a plan for your life. Moses' excuses don't stop. He goes on to his fourth excuse. He says to God, look at me. 
God look at me? In verse 10 of chapter 4, he says, Oh Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Look at me, God. Do you realize who you're talking to? You want me to lead the people of God out of slavery into the promised land? I can't even, ha I can't even speak properly. I have a speech impediment. Do you realize? I think you've knocked on the wrong heart, God. Look at me. And God's response was a powerful one. And I'm sure all of us have a list of reasons why we have told God that he can't be calling us to do that. He answers him in verse 11 and 12. He says, who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. God created us with all of our sense of inadequacy. He knows full well who he's calling us out to. He created you. You think that at the end of this litany of excuses that Moses now was convinced, but he's not. He has one final excuse. And in many ways, it's one, when I read it, I'm burdened by it. In many ways, excuse number five says, send someone else. Send someone else. Get somebody else to do it. Verse 13 of chapter 4, oh Lord, please send somebody else to do it. God's response, you can only imagine. Verse 14 says, then the Lord's anger burned against him. The Lord's anger burned against Moses and he said to him, what about your brother, Aaron the Levite? Moses, I'm giving you an opportunity and you keep shutting the door to my face. What about your brother? You think he can come with you? Would you like that? And so the story unfolds. He and Aaron go out to lead the people. As you read the story, however, in many ways, Aaron became a problem for Moses. You'll remember that it was Aaron who, when Moses was up on the mountain meeting with God, encouraged the people to give him all the gold and build a golden calf that they would worship. It was later on Aaron and his sister Miriam who conspired against their very own brother because they became jealous and envious of him. And they began to spread gossip and slander of their very own brother because they wanted to be in charge. You wonder if Moses had moments of reflection back to when God called him at the bush and I'm sure he thought, I should have just listened. It's an indication of sometimes we learn the hard way, don't we? But it's also an indication of God's grace. He could have easily said, you know what, Moses? I'm tired of talking to you. I've answered every one of your excuses, and then you have the audacity to tell me, send somebody else. This holy God could have poured down his anger on Moses that day, and it would have been it. But he grants him grace. I do want to conclude with this thought, Pastor Chris, if you can. And please stay focused on this. I've been reflecting on the words of A.W. Tozer in his book entitled The Knowledge of the Holy. And in one of his chapters, he speaks about the self-sufficiency of God. I want you to think about that. The self-sufficiency of God. God is almighty. He's all-powerful. He doesn't need. 
He has no need. He's not like us. He's almighty and all-powerful. He's self-sufficient. Would you agree? Okay, stay with me. Almighty God, Tozer says this, just because he is almighty needs no support. The picture of a nervous God fawning over men to win their favor is not a pleasant one. Yet if we look at the popular conception of God, that is precisely what we sometimes see. Christianity has put God on charity. So lofty is our opinion of ourselves that we find it quite easy, not to say sometimes, unfortunately, unenjoyable, to believe that we are necessary to God. And probably the hardest thought of all of our natural egotism to entertain is that God does not need our help. He's self-sufficient. We commonly represent him as this busy, eager, somewhat frustrated father hurrying about seeking help to carry out his benevolent plan to bring peace and salvation to the world. We've made him into this God who's out there, oh man, I can't convince anybody to volunteer for me. And maybe it's because of us pastors sometimes we come across that way. Too many appeals are based upon this frustration of Almighty God. And an effective speaker can easily excite pity in his hearers, not only for the heathen, but for the God who has tried so hard and so long to save them and has failed for want of their support. I fear that thousands of younger people enter Christian service and labor from no higher motive than to try to help deliver God from his embarrassing situation. As I reflected on these words, I, I got to be honest, I was stopped dead in my tracks. In many ways, I was humbled. Humbled by the reality of a self-existent, self-sustaining self-sufficient God. I realized that God doesn't need me. God doesn't need my church. God, God doesn't need you. God doesn't need our conferences. He doesn't need our concerts or conventions. He doesn't need our plans or programs. He doesn't need our budgets, our buildings. He doesn't need it. Because he's self-sufficient. The reality is that you and I, your church and my church, all the structures we've constructed and all the stuff we've created can turn to dust and God could still make a great name for himself among the nations. So you might be saying, Joe, what are you trying to say? Like, I thought you were going to try to get us engaged. Here's my point. God does not involve us in his grand global purpose because he needs us. He involves us in his grand global purpose because he loves us. Because he loves you and because he loves me. He invites me to be part of his grand mission. He gives me the honor and the privilege to be part of his global mission. He knows that if I learn to give away my life, I'll find it. He knows that it's more blessed to give than to receive. So he gives me an opportunity because he loves me. He gives it to me because he loves me. So there should be no putting arms behind your back. Can you serve, please? No, can you serve? Because your God loves you. And he wants you to be part of his grand mission. 
all of a sudden the way I pastor is a little different, isn't it? The way I do his work, boy, there's a level of excellence because this is unto him. I do it unto him. All of a sudden it's not just being an usher. It's being an usher. It's not just watching kids. It's ministering to kids. We don't need more members. We need more ministers. People who are ready to get in the game and on the team to do the work of God because he loves you. Is it going to cost you? You bet. Labor and work always costs you. It will cost you your time. It will cost you your treasure. But he gives you that opportunity because he loves you. Not because he needs you. So, in your bulletin, you'll find these cards. I want you to grab it for me, please. We're part of God's team here. And I believe that God is on the brink of wanting to see what we're made of. Friends, we need all hands on deck if we're going to continue to reach more people. This morning, I wonder, in the back of this card, it says, it's game time, let's do this. In many ways, I'm asking you to make a commitment to God's team. Saying, Pastor, maybe you already volunteer. That's okay, I want you to fill this out. It'll enable us to connect with you and encourage you and thank you and pray for you. Spur you on. Maybe for some of you, you're, you're on a schedule. You're once every four or five weeks, but God is tugging at your heart and you're thinking, I could do more than that. Or maybe you get blessed every week you come, but God is telling you today, he's calling you by name. He's saying, I need you now to start serving, contributing, being part of this team. I want you to fill out this card and on the way out, our ushers will be there. I want you to put it in. And every Tuesday, our staff, we're committed to this. We're going to pray through these cards. We're going to start connecting with you, encouraging you. We believe in Ephesians 4 that pastors, leaders are here to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. So we want to help you. We want to equip you. We want to encourage you to reach your full potential in Christ Jesus. And together, as we work towards the same mission and vision, with God on our team, nothing can stop us.